because it's not just on God. Okay, God wants to bless you. You're called to a blessing. Like I said earlier, the promises of God are yes and amen. He promises you in a bunch of different verses that you will be blessed if. So let's talk about the if tonight, okay? Let's talk about that big, giant elephant in the room, if. And, and the thing is, is we don't really like that word because that means there's responsibility. That means there's, there's something falling on my end that could be holding up my blessing. And so I want to just dig into some word because I think that's where the answer is. I'm not a big, let's, that's my opinion, whatever. That's fine. That's good. People have opinions about the Bible. Let's just read the Bible because to me, that's, that's good. It's good enough, I promise. So I'm going to start in the Jeremiah 17, chapter uh, 17, verses 7 through 8. It says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him, whose confidence is in him. Again, when we make a seed that's bigger than normal, my confidence is in you, Lord. I, I can't normally do this, but I'm believing because I have full confidence in you that not only can you get it back to me, but you're going to give me what I've been asking for. And so it says, they will be like trees planted by the water that send out its roots by the stream. Again, we got to send out our roots. Sometimes it doesn't just fall on the tree to just sit there. It's got to send out its roots. Otherwise, it never gets the nutrients that it's needing. In our lives, we have to send out our roots sometimes. Again, it falls on up. The tree can't just be planted by the stream. It's got to grow toward the stream, otherwise it ain't going to get no water. So you've got to send out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes in our lives. Heat is coming, I promise you. In Texas, heat is here. Thank you, Jesus. Now, thank God it was a little nicer today. Um, but we'll see how the rest of the week goes. It leaves uh, are always green. Here's the big one. It never has to worry in a year of drought. And it never fails to bear fruit. Come on, God calls us to bear fruit. God calls us to bear fruit. We have to bear fruit. It is one of the prerequisites God puts in our life. And what is fruit? Fruit is the blessing of labor. Fruiting, fruit is the blessing of process. There has to be a process in our life. There has to be a pruning. There has to be a taking away. There has to be a fertilizing. There has to be a watering. All of these things have to happen in order for this thing to bear fruit. And so tonight, that's what I want to talk to you guys about. Again, I want to give a special shout out to Miss Cheryl. Thank you for always helping me out with PowerPoint. You're the sweetest. I send her like the crappiest notes you've ever seen. And she sent, and she makes pretty stuff out of it. It's amazing. So grateful for her, really. If it was up to me, I'm not big on notes. I, I just, I want to just preach. I just want to talk. But pastor's like, man, it's, it's for the people. Yeah, I get it. But if they take notes, they're good, right? So they should be taking notes, not me. But it's good. We're going to work through this. So, listen. So, Proverbs 10, 22 says this. The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Proverbs 10, 22. I want you guys to remember this verse. It's something that stuck with me since I was very, very young because I realized one thing. The blessing, singular, of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Okay. God's plan is to bless us. God wants to bless us. It is his supernatural power toward us as a father. Listen, I don't know a dad that's like, man, son, I want you to be miserable. I want you to be terrible at life. I want the worst things. That no, no father does that. And if our father who gives good gifts, this is what the Bible says, he's a father of light and he gives good gifts. Listen, he wants you to find his blessing. The Easter eggs that he has set out for you, he wants you to find them. How do you find them? You got to look for them. Listen, I always say this, and because I so believe it, God doesn't put blessings and he doesn't put things in your lap. He puts them in your reach. You have to go get them. There are things in life that you're going to have to work toward that will never find you unless you go working toward it. You have to start to look because there are blessings that are waiting for you, but they will keep waiting as long as you're not willing to go looking. Okay? So this is God's plan for us is that he wants you. He doesn't want you broke. He doesn't want you sick. He doesn't want you tired. He doesn't want you worn out. He wants you prosperous. He wants you overflowing. And he wants you to be able to make a difference everywhere you go. That's the reality. That's what he wants. 
This is God's plan for your life. You're saying, well, God, what do you want from me? I want you to be blessed. I want you to be the head, not the tail. I want you to be salt, and I want you to be light. How do I do that? We got to get close to him. We got to find it. We have to. First, I want to talk to you about this. We have to get to a place where we realize this. Okay, the blessing of God is a big difference than me making my own blessing. Okay? The blessing of God is a big difference between me making my own blessing and him overflowing my life. I can find a blessing, and I put parentheses there because is it really a blessing when I make it happen? No, it's not. But I can begin to believe myself that it is. I can. I can make it happen, but here's what happens. It doesn't last long. It fails. It dies out. God's blessing says that he makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Again, a guitar player. We've seen a bunch of them. They get to be famous. It's a blessing. They can play guitar. What happens? Pretty soon they're strung out on drugs. Pretty soon they're given into social pressures. Pretty soon they media's in their face watching everything they do that's sorrow that's 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 sorrow being added with that and god said man i can do so much better for you than that one like i was telling james earlier what we have to begin to realize is that my blessing is not necessarily and i say necessarily because i do believe that god can overflow our lives financially but the american church too long has simply believed that when God said he wants to bless me, that that means I'm going to have a bigger boat, bigger house, and a bigger car, right? My fence is going to get just a little bit taller. Man, that's ain't, that ain't what God wants. That's not the blessing of the Lord. The blessing of the Lord is my kids aren't in the hospital. The blessing of the Lord is my kids walk with God. The blessing of the Lord is my bills are paid. Amen? Not that, okay, you know what? I'm just swimming in money. That that's that's not the blessing of the Lord. We, as Americans, we have this mindset, and really Western civilization in, in general, because you could go to Europe and find the same thing. If you can find God over there, they'll, they'll be talking about the same thing. And, and that is, man, when you give your life to God, everything's just perfect. And, man, that's such a fallacy. There's, it's such a fallacy, guys. There's, God never intended your life to just get easy. Jesus comes to the earth, was his life easy? <laughs> they want to string him up. Why? Because he began to walk out the kingdom. And when we become sons and daughters of the kingdom, it says that you will be persecuted as I am persecuted, if not more. So get ready. But what's my blessing? Is that I know that he's got my back, that he's making a way when there seems to be no way. That there, there's in the desert, when I feel like, okay, I'm at my driest place I've ever been, bam, streams of living water begin to flow into my life. It does not make sense. That's the beauty of God. It doesn't have to make sense because it's supernatural. It doesn't make sense in the natural, but God says, listen, I'm not defined or limited by your natural. I can do exceedingly abundantly above what you think or imagine. I can think and imagine a lot of things, H. And he's saying, dude, I, I will blow your mind. One glimpse into heaven and you're going to Because we think, again, from a, from a very Western mindset, and I'm telling you, stretch yourself. Quit thinking from a Western mindset. Begin thinking in the kingdom, and all of a sudden your life will be open to the blessings that are waiting for you. So, again, it's, it's not a self-made blessing. It's not something that I can create on my own. I can go to college and get a good job. That's not a blessing. That's just hard work, and that's the fruit of hard work. Now, I can get a good job where I got a good boss. My benefits are good. Now we're starting to get into a blessing, okay, from the Lord. But, again, I had to work for something first. I had to get somewhere so that he could begin to bless something, okay? God does not. He's not in the, he's supernatural, but he ain't trying to just give to you. He wants you to have to work for something. So how do we get there? How do we position ourselves? First is obedience. Obedience simply says this. It's compliance with an order, request, or law. Here's the best part. Submission to another's authority. That's the one we struggle with, right? 
that's that's the kicker oh yeah okay law's good compliance with the orders okay we can kind of follow that as long as it doesn't require me to go the speed limit or stop completely at the stop sign or you know but submission to another's authority hmm, now we're getting eh, this is a little, whoa 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 you stepping on toes right but that's what god's calling us to he said listen when you completely submit your life you begin to call me lord not just savior not just I saved you because you were in a bad spot and you begin to cry out. And then once you're out of that bad spot, oh, yeah, that God guy, I liked him. He was cool for a season. Listen, I'm talking about real salvation and real walking with Christ. Once I make him Lord, then all of a sudden my life begins to shift. And not just because I'm, like I said, um, I watched my brother get what I call jailhouse saved about 50 times. He's like, oh, man, yeah, I'm on fire for God. I love God. But boy, he told me the other day, he said, David, I just, I can't, I can't live right. And I said, dude, listen. He's like, I know the word. And I said, yeah, because listen, you can know the word until you begin to apply it. It is not going to change your life. Because guess what? The devil knows the word. <laughs> the devil understands the word. Didn't change anything for him. It's the application of the word that will begin to change your life. We have to begin to not only learn it, to walk it out. I would rather apply one scripture than know 50 of them. Amen? we got to get to this place. So obedient. So I had a buddy of mine. He's a pastor in Oklahoma City. He called me, actually in Edmond, which is just north of Oklahoma City. He called me the other day. A couple in the church had been fighting, you know, blah, blah, blah. Not to get into details, but he said, listen, they've been fighting, and I'm uh-huh, I'm listening. He said, I know what you would have said, David. You would have just said, quit. And I said, mm-hmm. So, H, you got kids. I know one of them. Probably a little rowdy as a, as a young man, huh? Probably a little bit like myself. I know Daniel was probably, you know, yeah, I know. I know. He was a, he was an, he was a little angel, you know. But when they were doing something really irritating, or just something that you knew, hey, look, you shouldn't be doing. What did you tell me? Yeah. Quit. Right? <laughs> Travis, we ain't trying to bring up the past, okay? Listen, that's what he said. And I can guarantee you, every parent in this place, I could ask them the same question, and they're all going to say the same thing. Stop. Right? So here's my question for you. I began to think about this the other day, and I thought, Lord, you funny. So, as a kid, your expectation for that child, when you say stop, is to what? It's to stop. Quit. Don't do it again. And, and exactly, immediately. Why is it that as we become adults, when someone says stop, it ain't enough? How is it that I can tell my five-year-old, who has little understanding of how this world works, until you ask her, then she knows how everything works. But how is it that somebody with such a limited understanding of how the world works is supposed to stop immediately, but somebody that's gathered experience and gathered life is told to stop, and they can't? What happens? Where does that go? How is it that it's so easy for me to tell my child to stop, and then my wife is saying, hey, David, you got to quit doing this, and I'm like, bro, man, tell me. Right? How ignorant. Like, I, I, be, I begin to think about it, and I'm like, how, how do we get to that place where as a kid, like, my expectation is you better quit as soon as I tell you until mom comes in the room, and then it's a little leniency happens. As Pastor always says, the <laughs> mom is a minister of mercy, right? In my house, that's the truth. I can promise you. She was out of town for a week, and those kids, they got very little mercy given to them okay listen it was when i say stop that means stop five minutes ago okay <laughs> yeah exactly don't even start like i ain't got the time or the patience right now you better quit but i, I just begin to think about that how is it that as a kid i can be told to stop and i'm expected to stop but as an adult we go to we go to you know our pastors and we're like pastor you know i really got trouble with this and this and this the pastor looked at you, I promise you, if the pastor ever looked at somebody like that and just said, quit. You be... What? What? 
Okay, well, what does the Bible say? It says quit. Like, listen to me. I promise you. I can, pro I can show you. It says quit. Don't do it anymore. Where, where does it go? I don't know. This is just a food for thought tonight because I begin to sit there and think about it because that's my answer to everything. Look, when someone is like, hey, David, I got a problem with this, I'm like, okay, well, quit doing that. I don't understand how that's bad advice. I feel like that's good advice. Don't do it anymore. Problem solved, right? But it's not. It's, there's apparently a disconnect as we get older, and it's like, no, I need 32 steps in order for me to be able to achieve this thing, okay? I need 12 steps, and I will never drink again. I need, and come on, look, I, I can tell you how to get over your problem. Fall in love with Jesus so much that you don't want that stuff no more. That's the answer. My proximity with Jesus is the answer. How close I can get to God, it's the answer. But we think that I have to, like, you know, spend a bunch of money, see a psychologist. He can tell me 32 things to do. And, and I'm sitting here telling you, no, look, I can save you a ton of money. I can save you a ton of problems. Just don't do it no more. And your life will be so much better. Now, I know that's really simple and that's hard, but at, it works 100% of the time. I'm just saying. Just so listen, Deuteronomy 30, 16 says this, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commandments, decrees, and law. Then you will live and increase. It's a promise of God. Keep my commandment, you will live, and you will increase. Do what the law says, and you'll live, and you'll increase. I want to tell some of my brothers and sisters in the world right now, Quit resisting arrest, you'll live, and you'll increase. It's that simple. But because there's been problems and there's been issues and because socially we, we think that there's some kind of stigma for cops against certain folks that we got to, listen, put your hands on the steering wheel, put your driver's license above you, and we're going to save some lives today. Okay? Compliant. That's all we need. But, again, it's too simple. It's too easy. Why is it that as we get to be old, adult, we just can't take the simple things anymore? It's too hard for us to digest the easiest things in the world to digest. And I'm, I'm telling you today, listen, there's problems in your life. Look, we can get over it. His name is Jesus. Amen? So we can live and increase. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Listen, some of you guys are in maybe a transition season. This is sometimes where I'm like, okay, baby, you know what? What are we going to do? How are we doing this? What are we doing with this? And, and we begin to ask each other questions. This is where I feel like we need to be. Listen, first, just begin to obey. Just do the things you know you're supposed to do and you're going to begin to set yourself up for what's next, right? It's simple. It really is. My kid, keep your room clean. Don't spit out your food at the table. You know, little thing. You know, I mean, you, I tell my kids things that I never, ever thought, ever thought I would ever say out of my mouth, and I've had to tell them. Like, you know, don't pull the gum under the chair and eat it. Bro. Right? But those are things you actually have to tell children, right? Very much so. Y'all laugh, but you was that kid one day that earlier in life, your mom and dad was like, listen, I, th th there's lots of, I mean, you could put, there's lots of things in your own lives. And as parents, you guys have a lot more experience with this than I do. But I, I have had to tell my children at times, don't do, and I'm like scratching my head like, why did I have to? tell my kid that that is so weird they don't understand yet it's like hey freak up thanks you're the best they're at the perfect height they're looking at it they're like oh what a sweet guy i'm like god oh, rose that ain't the blessing of the lord son <laughs> listen <laughs> that ain't when mama gives it to you that's a blessing of the lord when when you don't know who gave it to you that's gross 
Anybody getting ready to transition in, in the next way, listen up. Obedience is the key to your next. Whoever gives heed to instruction and prospers, whoever gives heed to instruction will prosper and be blessed, is the one who trusts in the Lord. The person that trusts in the Lord. Again, when Susan stood up and said that, I was like, oh, you don't even know. You just set me up. Go ahead. Testify. Whenever we trust in the Lord and we say, God, I know that you got me. And my knower of knowers, I know that when I give this gift, man, it's going to stretch me. I may not be able to do the thing that I wanted to do. I may not be able to buy the fishing pole I wanted to buy. I may not be able to buy the, you could fill in the blank in your own life. But all of a sudden I say, you know what, God, I just feel like I want to give you a gift. Not because I want my life blessed, because I want to bless you. Listen, this is the big thing. Our obedience must be out of our heart okay look there are people that will do things because they want to be seen doing things now the beauty of god is he knows the intent of their heart the beauty of our boss is he don't and you're looking at him like you know that was fake right like i saw that a mile away you you saw that too right but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because god's sitting up there saying dude listen when you give according to your heart being cheerful, according to you being sacrificial, then all of a sudden, it doesn't matter. No man can turn away the blessing that I can pour out on your life. No man can stop it. No man can make it happen for you like I can make it happen. And I'm like, okay, here we go. So whoever gives heed to instruction prosper. And blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, continue to trust in the Lord. Because when we trust, God says, I can, I can do stuff for you that nobody else can. Amen? Either. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, I want to I wanna be very clear on this. I read a statistic today, and I thought, there's probably a lot of truth to that, but as a young man in ministry, I'm thinking, that ain't good. So I read a statistic, and they said, on average, the American people give 2.5% of their income. I want to challenge you tonight. Now, pastor can correct me on Sunday. He can spank me in front of y'all on Sunday. That's okay. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt that when the Lord said a tenth, he meant a tenth. That does not mean 2.5%. It don't mean 6%. It don't mean 7%. And it don't mean 8%. And it don't mean 9%. 10% is 10%. Listen, that isn't a suggestion. That's where God says, look, this is the, the basics, okay? And then if you want to go to Malachi, he says, you've robbed me of what? My tithe and my offering. Watch out. Watch out now, David. You're stepping on toes. You can't go there. You can't tell church folk about money. They don't like that. But listen, I'm here to tell you because I want you guys to be blessed, and I want this church to go to the next level, and I realize that it's going to be in our giving that's going to help us get there. You can't have provision without a vision. We got a vision. We need the provision. You have to. If you believe in the vision, it's really easy to give into the provision. Amen? It's really easy. But if you're not believing, then what happens? Your wallet goes with me. My, my money, my treasure, where my heart is. Is your heart here or not? A simple. Do you love this place or not? Do you want to find a blessing in your life or not? I, and I know that's going to maybe offend somebody. Please, you can talk to me after. I will, I will be as kind about this as you want, as, as I can be. But a tenth means a tenth. That's as simple as it comes. Like when God said ten, he meant ten. That, that, um, I, I, I hit that hard enough, I guess, because <laughs> I see a lot of faces just looking at me. So 10% means 10%. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. That's what he told Saul. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. But I will say this. Sacrifice with obedience produces a blessing in your life. When you get to the place that it's not just about, okay, am I being obedient? Yeah, okay, there's a lot of people that are morally good out there. They're obedient to the law. The, why are they not living in the blessing of God? Simply because they're not sacrificing anything toward it. How do I know this? I could look at Mary Magdalene. 
Okay, when we look at Mary Magdalene, we know, we know without a shadow of a doubt that Mary Magdalene, she gave her, most people believe, her dowry. Okay, dowry was simply the, the thing that she was saving for her husband. Okay, to give to his family as a, as a gift. You had to buy your way in a family. Kind of weird. It's a little different than, than we got it today. Now you're hoping you get a good, rich husband so you can sneak in there, right? Good, a good, rich wife so you can sneak on in there. Right, you're just hoping that's the cherry, right? <laughs> why are you laughing? Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> Bless the riches, Lord. <laughs> My man kids. <can't> <laughs> anyway, we'll step on some toes there later. But so this is my point with her. So she takes to Jesus. She goes and she begins to wash his feet. She begins to pour the oil down his head. She begins to take her hair. The very thing that was supposed to be extremely dignified in her culture. The thing that made her a woman. The thing, and, and she did like David. And she said, if this is undignified, man, I'll do more. I don't care because my moment of sacrifice, my moment of worship, my moment of being with the king is more important than protocol, is more important than social standing, is more important than a husband, is more important because I know if I could do this one thing, then all that other stuff's going to fall in line. And so when she broke that alabaster box, not only did she say, I don't care if I ever receive a husband, not only did she say, I don't care what these men in this room who have failed to do, who were the close ones, the disciples, the one that were running around with him, Every single day, it took a woman to say, listen, guys, you're missing it. You're sitting around him every single day, but you're missing it. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but you're missing it because she believed 100% more than anything in her world that he was worth it. So I ask you with a sacrifice, is he worth it? Can we take obedience and then on top of that, have a sacrifice of praise, have a sacrifice of giving, have a sacrifice of something in my life, of my time, of my gifts, of my talents. And can I say, Lord, I'm going to give this to you because I believe you're more than enough. Because I believe that not only when I give this to you that it's going to be returned back to me, but it's going to be a gift that I lay at your feet because I think you're worth it. Not just because I'm going to receive something, but simply because I love you more than life. Because the air I breathe, I know it's because of you. That's where we got to get. Proximity. Nearness in space, time, and relationship. This is one of my words that just drives me lately. It, it has been for the last probably two years. But it's just, nearness in space, time, and relationship. It's just, I need to be closer to you. I need to be closer to you. Trust me, if you're close to him, you need to be closer. If you're far from him, you need to be closer. There has to come to a place where I'm saying, Lord, if I can't have you, I don't want nothing at all. And now that's a tough statement in America because we lack our stuff, right? We want, we want more fishing poles. That's me. I don't know about y'all. More guns, more, more trucks. What, what are you, you, no payments. I'm saying more truck, no payments, more truck, <laughs> right? It's just what Americans want. We want bigger houses. And, and somehow that's like social status, right? Look at my truck. Look at my fishing pole. Look at my wife. Look at, and, and we're all doing it so that we're hitting these check marks magically. Like, oh, yeah, look, I've, okay, look, Facebook, here you go. I'm going to give you a little something I feel about Facebook. The reason I'm not a huge fan of it is it's projection. That's what Facebook is. Now, I love all y'all that are making your posts. And I need to see them because I want to keep praying for y'all. But listen, when I get on there, and I get on there, and all I see is, oh, look at this, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, project. They're trying to make something appear better than it really is. Why? Because that somehow gives us validation where we get a bunch of thumbs up from people that we don't even really know. And I'm like, why is this such a big deal to us? Who cares? Look, my grandkid. Come out, look at him. He, he threw the ball four miles an hour. Look, at he's amazing. Great. I can kick the ball farther than that. Like, what? why is that a big deal? 
And why are we why are we get so excited about that? Look, I love I love I love my family. You won't see me post about them a lot. First of all, because I know most folks don't really care. They're gonna give you a f thumbs up, and they don't even really care. It's like, oh, oh pfft, somebody put a picture up. I better like it. Otherwise, they may be mad at me. Like I even knew you were on there. I mean, I, I, I think I'm talking to the right folks tonight because there's something about Facebook that just irritates me. Not only do I not like the guy that created it, because I think he's a scumbag, but the reality of all the people that are on there just trying to look at me, 20-year reunion, showed up looking exactly the same as I used to, acting the same as I used to, but, oh, look at this. I got 32 followers. Who cares? Why is this such a big deal in our lives? Why are we giving so much time to it? And God's saying, listen, I want you to be close to me. Don't worry about what all those people are doing out there. Find me. Listen, you want validation, go to the king. Who cares what your classmates from 32 years ago have to say about what you're doing now? And they live in, you know, Timbuktu. Like for all my friends, they're all in California. I don't even call them friends because the reality is, they, I don't even know what they're doing. Don't know the names of their kids. Don't know their birthdays. Don't know none of it. But it comes up on my Facebook. Hey, it's their birthday today. Another day. Yeah. Thumbs up. Right? I know, I know I'm being real simple tonight, but this is just, I, I mean, this is the way I view life sometimes. I'm just like, got to the place where I'm like, God, I, you got to help me because I'm, I'm seeing things just way too simply that I could help America right now if somebody would listen. Too long Western believers have searched for God, listen to this, with their hands out instead of their hands up. Too long have Western believers been looking for God with their hands out instead of their hands up. We have to get to a place that we become worshiping warriors, that we're saying, look, I don't care what the guy in back of me thinks right now. I'm going to put my hands up because you're worth it, God. I don't care. And look, I know some of y'all was raised Baptist. That's like really a stretch for y'all. And I, 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 that's fine. Do what you got to do. But listen, worship God with your whole heart. Because when you begin to worship God that way, you open up the windows of heaven. And all of a sudden, you begin to sit at his feet. When you begin to search for his head and not his hands, then all of a sudden, you got his heart. Not, listen, what did he say? He said, where my heart is, my treasure is. You begin to seek for God and find his heart, I promise you, every cattle on a thousand hills is yours. He's waiting for you to find it. I promise you, he's waiting for you to find that thing. You just got to say, look, I believe it. I believe it. God, you're big enough, and I'm going to go after it. Now, this, I was telling James, I, I read this verse, and I've heard a thousand people preach on it, probably literally a hundred sermons, legit, because everyone uses it. But I heard this, and I thought, bro, God, you, you opened my eyes to some stuff. It says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. In the ninth hour, a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate. Now, pastors talked about this. He was getting prostituted out. That's probably the reality of it. Somebody was taking him up to the gate so he could make some money so that they could, get, they could make a little bit of coin off of it, right? They was making their percentage. I'll carry you to the gate as long as I get a cut, okay? That's just the reality. That's how their system worked. So he laid at the gate daily, and they called the gate beautiful to ask alms for those who were entering the temple, who, seeing Peter and John, about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, John and Peter said, listen, <laughs> I love this. Look at us. Listen, he was already looking at him. He's like, hey, I see y'all going into the temple. Hey, y'all got any money? Y'all got, what you got for me today? And they said, look at us. Like he wasn't already looking at him. I don't know. I, I guess they were trying to say, really what they're saying is, give me your attention. Look, at, I'm about to give you something, but you have to give me your attention. So he said this. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And when I read that, I felt like the Holy Spirit kicked me in the back. And I thought, 
He said, David, how many times have I sat up in heaven and I said, David, 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 and you gave me your attention expecting to receive something from me. Not because you wanted to give me your attention, not because you felt like, Jesus, you're more than whatever I'm doing right now. Jesus, you're more than the task at my hand. But simply you looked at me and you gave me attention because you were looking for something. A lot of times we get in trouble. We fall behind. We do whatever you can fill in the blank. And then all of a sudden, what do we do? Lord, God, hey. Hey, uh, yeah, um, you know, I may have bought that new fishing pole last month, but my kids need some milk today. Uh, any way you can make that happen? Right? We start giving God attention. We start giving God attention when we need something. I'm saying, look, I thought about something the other day that just really began to, I, I began to chew on a little bit. It's amazing how many, like, overcoming stories you read about, right? Guy lost his leg, ends up in the Olympics. Guy, you know, you, you, rock fell on him. He's an amazing author now, blah, blah, blah. What would happen if those bad things never happened to us and we just gave our focus to something? If I didn't have three arms, two arms and one leg, how much more could I do? Why is it that we have to wait for some crazy obstacle to be able to get done what God has called us to do from the beginning? I, I, I began to ponder that for my own life. I'm like, God, would it take that for me? Would it take something crazy happening for me to give you all my attention? For me to say, look, my focus is 100% this way instead of you know 10% here, 5% there, 4% here. God say, man, I, just give me your attention. Not because you're going to get something, but because I'm worth it. And I'm like, yes, Lord. So my question to you is, why does God get our attention? Why does God get your attention? Sometimes, I'm going to be honest. He gets my attention because I'm in a tough spot. Because I'm saying, Lord, I, I need your help. Now, there's nothing wrong with calling out to God in time of need. We know that. But if that's the only time you're calling on him, there's a reason you have to keep calling on him in a time of need. You feel me? Make sense? Our worship. We have to worship. We have to get closer to God. Because when we begin to get closer to God, hearing gets better. Hearing gets better. Think about it. God's calling, and you're a million miles away from him. My kids, they right here, I'm like, Benaya. hey. And y'all see me, I'm like wrestling two alligators up here during worship. Why, I can, I can yell at him real quiet in his ear right here. Some of us so far away, we can't even hear him. And he's whispering, he's whispering. Elijah says that he, he, he came at him in fire, came at him wind, came at him all this stuff, but what happened? He was whispering, Elijah. Elijah, Eli he's doing the same thing today. He hadn't changed. God ain't changed. He's whispering. The problem is we got so much noise going on with Facebook and life and everything else that we can't hear him. What happens when we begin to worship? We begin to knock all that stuff out. We begin to put all that stuff away, and we say, you know what, God? My focus is on you again. Even if just for a brief moment I stop what I'm doing, and I say, Lord, you know what? My focus is everywhere right now, but I want my focus to be on you so that I can begin to get closer to you so I can hear your whispers. Why? Because it's a lot easier to obey something when you can hear it. If I want to set up the blessing in my life, I have to be able to hear the voice of God so that I can move toward that. If I can't hear him, it's a lot harder to follow after him. Amen? I can see something that's closer. I can see something that's closer. I don't care if you have the best eyes in the world. If it's three miles away, you don't see it. How can I follow after God if I can't see him? If I don't know where he's at. So we follow after him because we can see him. We can hear him. When we get close, we're just running after God. And we're saying, you know what, God? I so want to be close enough that I can see you. Lastly, do something. Do something. God wants to bless you. But he cannot bless nothing. 
He refuses to bless nothing. It's one of the prerequisites. You have to do something. Why? He said, I want to bless the hands of, I want to bless the work of your hand, right? So the Lord will open up the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send the rain on your land in seasons and to bless all the work of your hand. You will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow from none. This is what he promised his people, and I promise you that promise exists today. Didn't stop because Israelite became a nation. Didn't stop. And he said, look, this is for my people. Read it. It's there. Take it. If you want that promise, take it. By the work of your hand, by the work of your hand, by the sweat of your brow, I want to bless you, but you have to do something. May the favor of the Lord, our God, rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hand. That's Psalms 97. He wants to establish whatever you put your hand to, but he can't establish nothing. He has to establish something. I have to do something. I, I, I'll end with this. In the Far East, there's a, a tree known as bamboo. Okay, not, not the American bamboo that we see all the time. It's like gets up in our grass and everything else, and we see it in Texas. No, no, no. The Chinese bamboo, it takes five years for it to grow. Of every single day, somebody going out, watering it, fertilizing it, nurturing it, looking after it, continuing to labor after this thing. It takes five whole years for that seed to even pop up out of the ground. Five years for that seed to pop up out of the ground. There's been process. Some of us have been believing for something new in our life. Five years it took that gardener to sit there and fertilize water. When there was nothing, when it looked like nothing was happening, so many times in our life when we feel like, okay, there's nothing happening. It's not going the way. Here's what happened. Comparison right? I've been watering this tree for five years, and I ain't seen even a sprout come out. What happens? I look over my neighbor, and they got a little orange tree right here, three foot tall in them. Man, he already got a tree coming out. That's what Facebook's a killer for. Listen to me. You want to find yourself dying in your dreams. Start comparing your life to somebody else. I promise you, because your process is much different than your neighbor's process. And when we begin to compare ourselves, we begin to kill our own dream. We begin to tell God, look, you're not enough. You don't know what you're doing. I'm going to take it into my own hand. And if we're not careful, it took five years for that very little sprout to sprout up. But listen to this. In five weeks, that thing will reach 90 feet tall. Five weeks, that thing will reach 90 feet tall. If we're not careful in our dreams and in our blessing, we will give up in year two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, not saying, Lord, I don't know why this has not come to fruition when he's saying, listen, I gave you the building blocks for this thing. Just keep watering your dream, H. Just keep watering your dream. I'm going to make it happen, but you have to keep watering your dream. Just because you don't see fruit today doesn't mean that your roots are not growing deeper and deeper and deeper because some dreams take deeper roots so that they can last. Some dreams take a little more process so that they can come to fruition. Otherwise, what happens? We stunt the growth and then we can kill it easily. Our lives, if we're not careful, we can begin to compare and we can say, well, they got this and they got this and I don't even got a sprout. How many times do you think people come by that garden and be like, bro, what are you doing? I seen you here three years ago watering that thing. There still ain't nothing there. And that's where we get caught up. We listen to the voice of others. Why is it important that we stay close to the one that is guiding and manipulating and moving toward our dreams? Because he's the only one that knows the day that it's going to sprout. Our brothers, our sisters, if you would have looked at Job and all his friends, they're like, bro, you, you messed it. You missed it. And he said, no, I didn't miss it. I don't know what's going on, 
But I ain't cursing my God because I believe that there's something sitting on the other side of this, right? Job comes up out of that thing 10 times more rich than he was before. He was the richest man on earth to start with, but now he comes up out of there and he's 10 times richer than when he got sick. Sometimes your dream isn't dead. It's just being grown. It's just being watered. It's just, sometimes we water our dreams with our tears. When our friends come by and they're like, man, you ain't even. Sometimes, I promise you, there have been times where I'm like, Lord, I know you put things in my life and things in my heart. Man, I got to cry myself to sleep. I'm like, look, Lord, I hope deferred makes the heart sick, Dad. Uh, I'm getting kind of sick over here. I don't know what's going on because I haven't seen any fruit to my dream. Don't give up on it. Don't give up on the blessing of the Lord because I promise you, if you keep at it and you keep at it and you keep at it and you say, look, enough is enough. I'm going to run after this thing with all my heart. It's right around the corner. And I believe that for this church. I believe that for corporately and individually that some of y'all have been watering a dream and watering a dream and watering a dream. And you're saying, man, I feel like I've been watering this thing for long. And he's saying, yeah, but listen, your roots are getting deeper. Your roots are getting deeper. You're getting stronger. You just don't see it yet. And all of a sudden, bam, when that thing hits, the cool thing about God is he can expedite everything in our lives. He doesn't need to work within our natural means. He can move things exponentially. And I believe that for some of us. We've been watering dreams and we've been saying, Lord, I know you have something for me. Where's it at? And he said, right around the corner, son. Just keep trusting. Just in those times, pastor has a great saying for that. Don't forget in the dark what God promised you in the light. Don't forget that when you planted that seed, you knew it was going to take a long time. When you dream that dream, listen, I guarantee you, Joseph with his dreams, he didn't see four, five, six years in prison. That wasn't part of the dream. No, I saw myself high and lifted up. But he's saying, no, 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 no. You don't understand your process that you're getting ready to have to go through. There is process that's being happening. There is roots that are growing deeper. There are dreams that are being birthed. It takes a while sometimes. A woman with a baby. She's like, I'm pregnant. I'm excited. A man with a baby. She's pregnant. She's excited. Right? The same dream. One's closer to it than the other. Don't let a bad perspective keep you from your dream. Because I promise you, right around the corner, keep water, keep water, keep water. And when you do, you're going to see that thing grow up. And all of a sudden, it's going to be like, it was six inches yesterday, it's four foot today. It's 10 foot today. It's 12 foot today. All of a sudden, your dream's going to become a reality. And then all those Facebookers that didn't see nothing happening for a while because you were being shut up, because you were getting buried, because you knew I have something bigger than this. Don't let other people determine your dreams for you. Amen. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to communicate your word tonight. I know there were dreams. Lord, even in my own life, even in the lives of everybody on here, even in the lives of those on TV, on the Internet, I just pray that they would not give up on their dream, that they would not give up on their blessing, that they wouldn't allow naysayers and lack of fruit and the things that they think should be happening by now and the world standard to be the determining factor for their dream to come true. But instead, I just pray that they would stay steadfast, that they would water that thing, that they would be like the gardener in the Bible. Said, just give me one more year. I promise you this thing can produce. Just give me one more year and I can make it happen. And Lord, I'm just saying that for all those that have been waiting and waiting and waiting, we know that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but we also know that when hope comes to pass, all of a sudden, our lives can get excited. Our passion begin to ignite. And so I'm just praying for an ignition of passion once again for the things of God that we would want to be closer to you. 
that it wouldn't be enough to just get by, but we say, Lord, we can't get by until we get enough of you, and we know there's never enough of you. And let us just to find you, my King. Let our eyes to be open and our ears to be open so that we can hear and see you. More than anything in this world, we just want to be next to you. I love you. I thank you. I'm so grateful. I just pray that those that have been waiting for a dream to come past, that this was the hope that they needed. Because we know that just like that bamboo, Lord, some dreams need to be planted for a little longer. Some dreams need to be held in wraps for a little longer. But there is coming a day like Moses that it cannot be hidden any longer. Lord, that Moses was hidden until it could be not hidden any longer. And Lord, I just pray that some dreams cannot be hidden any longer, that they're going to begin to manifest. They're going to begin to show themselves and people are going to get excited once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.